Good morning and welcome to Community Conversations. I'm Vicki Green. Today we have a special story, not just about craft brewing business, which is a huge and growing industry, but it's about a family and how do you make a new business work as a husband and wife team. In studio today with me are Dave and Stephanie Richardson of Phillipston, Mass. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Now, if you don't know where Phillipston is, because our stations do go all around the state, it's in the north central, central western line right around Route 2. Now, Dave is a master brewer and founder of Flying Dreams Brewing Company in Worcester and Marlboro. And Stephanie has been involved in Dave's latest venture from day one, right? I have. Okay. Now, we met because I had heard you were opening this new tap room in Marlboro. For your business and had heard of your brewing site in Worcester, but I found out there's a lot more to your story. And so before we talk about the taproom and the craft beer industry in Massachusetts, let's talk about family, work, life balance. Okay. Now you have six kids, correct? We do. Okay. So what are their ages and who's foster, who's biological, and who's adopted? So we have six. There um the oldest is seventeen, he's our foster. We have a biological 16-year-old boy, 14-year-old boy, 8-year-old boy, 4-year-old boy. The 8-year-old's not biological. Oh, right, right. But See, so you can get sorry. confusing, Yeah, 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 there's a lot of them. Six kids. I, I get confused yeah, every day. A 4-year-old biological, um, and our daughter is 11 months old, so there's, there's five boys in the house, one little girl. Um, we, <laughs> uh, the 8-year-old is the adopted boy. Okay, and you just adopted him on National Adoption Day. We did, and he's the brother of my two oldest biological so to make sons. it more confusing here's the bottom line you have six children yes you have they're all your children yes four biological yes one adopted one foster yes okay but the adopted had was fostering with you before yes yes we've been fostering them for two years um and then we just adopted them on national adoption day on november 16th now you both work long hours and you've just opened this marlboro venture so how do you make it work dave um, uh, well, it's, the, you know, her mom is basically retired and, and she's an angel and uh, we would, shout out to mom. Yeah. yeah she's um, the best. we wouldn't be able to, to do what we're doing without, um, without her, you know, I, I mean, w- we basically have to hire someone to be my wife at work. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, not having to do that in the beginning of a business is really good, right? I mean, you got to keep your costs down in the, when you're starting businesses and stuff, right? From scratch, right? We have no, so, you know, we have no private investors really or, or anything. Um, a couple really, really small investors. But for the most part, you know, we've done it through bank loans and stuff. So um, there's no, like, safety net for us to draw from, And you've right? got a big family. So, yeah, and basically um, my mom, yeah. basically, whenever... Basically, my mom, it's like, kitchen. mom, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you when I can, but you got to basically be my nanny until <laughs> I can pay you. Because I want to, you know, I want her to be compensated. And, and she does love it. She loves taking care of the kids. And she'd, she'd prefer to be the one there doing it, you know, if I can't be. And I'm sure you prefer that. I do, because she, we're very, very similar. And I know she's going to love them just like I need them to be loved. So it makes me feel better when I can't be in the home that she's there doing it, you know? Now, Dave, is the pressure on you sometimes when you're opening a new... I mean, you've been in Worcester with Flying Dreams, which is the commercial brewery, and it's on Park Ave next to Peppercorns. It used to be where Wormtown, Wormtown Brewery was. Yes. It's now over on Shrewsbury Street. Very successful. And you've been in there successfully. Um, but did you get nervous when you said, I think I want to expand? Did the two of you have a conversation about family and about hours when you said, I want to now open... A tap room because you don't have a tap room in Worcester. It's a retail and a tasting space and brewing. I think yeah. we had the conversation actually when we first Dave decided to leave the Garden Ale House and we decided to open Flying Dreams in Worcester. We had this conversation like, well, he was like, you know, like this is going to be super hard. Like I'm going to have to be gone all the time. And can you handle it? Yeah, basically that's what it was. <laughs> and I and I and I was like, yeah. And then all this time, three years being open in Worcester was like, I have had definitely had moments where I've been like. I don't know if I can do this. I, I didn't. I didn't plan on. You know, my, I have a huge age gap between my children. Six children, sixteen years between my youngest to and my one oldest. one year yeah, old. Yeah. So, so I was like, it's at, at times it all, it feels like being a single parent again because I'm doing all all the child because care at home. Trying to get the he's business. Working. Right. Yeah. Right. You know. So it's all I have to keep in mind like the future. Like the the future is. This is not forever, you know. Not, nothing is, is. This is not permanent. Um, you know, he'll he'll be back. <laughs> you know, and I and I'm feeling super lucky. We're about to open this place in Marlboro, and I'm feeling 
super grateful that I'll be able to go to work and maybe spend a little time with my husband at work, too. So, there you go. Yeah. And the kids aren't around. Yeah. Because every once in a while, do you get date night or is it at the brewery? <laughs> That's kind of what we're excited about. Maybe we'll be able to spend yeah. a little time together there. Most of our date nights right now are because, like, someone invited us to be, go to some of the, one of their events. Okay, right? so you like need to co- be invited out Like more. an account of ours or something, you know, like... Um, a food event. You know, Moody's, delica- Delicatessen in... Waltham. Uh, in, in Waltham. Yeah. Right, invited us out to like an industry night thing, right, where they were. It was their fifth birthday celebration. Yeah, fifth. Uh, that, that's and, a great. And they invited like all their uh, like their accounts, like people that they order food and beer and you know the whole thing. And we went for that, and it was like date night, date night, <laughs> and business, right? So we're there's not we don't, the two. and moms at home. Yes, your mom yes. and your mom, right, Dave? Um, your mom. So and- my parents live next door, um, but they're like. Still pretty busy. My dad's still running his business, and my mom actually runs a, a private school uh, for K through six in, oh. in Royalston, Massachusetts. So they're much more busy, and they're but if you they're, had they're to. D- down the street. So my parents live two doors down from us, and you know, like we go there every every week for for pancakes. It's a tradition at, at my Aww. parents' house, right, and stuff like that. And they can take kids. all the kids and give them pancakes. But like, yeah, we, you know, we my that. parents aren't. They're not quite as, as like, her mom is like, give me the kids, whatever. And my parents are like, oh, we can't. We're doing this thing. We're doing this. <laughs> you know, so it's a little different. You, even though they're next door and they're a resource for us and everything, they're, they can't just can't be there. The Bottom line is my mom's the babysitter. Yeah. That, that's, but you have a supportive family. Totally. And if, if people didn't have family near them because people around the country adopt and they might not have family nearby, it sounds like it would make it that much harder. I mean, maybe you couldn't do six, but you could adopt or foster one. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the the adopting um, our eight year old Charlie, he, you know, we had no intentions to do foster care. Um, I got news that this child, who is the brother of my oldest children, um, went into the custody of DCF, and naturally, because his father, which is State Department, yeah, children family, yes, his father, um, their father passed away ten years ago. And, um, you know, Dave's been raising my two oldest boys with me since they were five and seven. And when we found out their brother at, went into foster care at, at six years old, I was like, Dave, I have a moral obligation to this child because his father's not here to speak on his behalf to make sure that he doesn't fall victim to being lost in the system and, and that he can have just as good of a life as his brothers have, you know? So I took, we took him in. Um, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done because he had a lot of behavioral things going mm-hmm. on. That's what people are afraid of. Th- yeah, they But are. you got through it. I did. And I didn't think I w- the first week I was like, I'm, I was really questioning my decision. Um, and then, you know, we, we got through it and, um, you know, the boy he is today is, just an amazing child. He's a super sweetheart. He's, you know, he pushes my buttons, but, you know, he's he's our son. I mean, we actually, he's our son now. You know, we adopted him. There's no chance he's ever going home. That was really hard for the first two years. You know, he, we never knew, you know, if he was going to be going back home. And, and it was hard to have this child that I couldn't give him a straight answer, you know. Um, but, and he was asking you because uh, I always he, thought it was the parents saying, I'm afraid to get too attached. And then the he, child he goes somewhere else. He didn't ask, but he always thought, I'm going to go home sometime, stuff, right? I'm going to go home. And I, and I said, you know, I don't know, buddy, probably someday, but I'm not really sure when, you know? And then, you know. Oh, I, he must have been so excited. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's day. an interesting little little creature. But, um, yeah, it's it's hard, hard to get excitement out of him in public. He's like kind of like a... Well, yeah. each to his own. So yeah, now you have it. a 17-year-old that you're fostering, right? Yeah. Now, what happens in that stage? Because you and I, we were talking about aging out of the system and what happened. So you you took him in when he was how old? Was he a teenager when you 16. Took- okay. Yep. So you knew that he wouldn't be with you, but what made you decide to foster someone because I know the older the kids get, the harder it is. It is to, teenagers for them to general. find a place. Yeah. Well, so this boy um is a junior um and goes to school with my o- oldest son who's also a junior at Narragansett. Um in Templeton, and uh, my son came to me and said, Mom, uh, a close friend of mine was just removed from his home. Aww. Since we're doing foster care, do you think we could help him? And I was like, ah, oh, God, I don't... Another one? Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, Dave, of course, was like, um, I, don't, I don't know about that. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And and so... And then <laughs> I said, honey, you got to do what you got to do. I'll back with I'll back you. There you go. Yeah, right? he did. Yeah, yeah, he's... Yeah, totally, totally, I'm always, totally. I'm always the voice of reason, but when it comes down to, like, a decision like that, it's all... I'll back up whatever she decides. And then you back him up when it comes to? 
Totally. The bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am like, you know, his biggest fan. Like, I'll tell you, like, I, I have nothing to do with the beer making process. So just like anybody out there in the world, I can say he makes the best beer that I've ever had because I'm just like another consumer. Like, he's just super and he's good won, at what, what he does. And he's won, 40 awards? Because we should back yeah. up for a minute. Yeah. We mentioned Gardner Ale House, and what we didn't mention, because we haven't gotten to the brewing piece yet, but it's come up, is that you were a partner, right? And you were the brewer the master brewer there yes, at the Gardner yes. Ale House for 10 years? Uh, just about. Nine, nine and change. Yeah. And I don't think people realize, too, when you make these recipes, it's very competitive. They have these international, national competitions where you get, have they have tastings and you win medals for certain things. And you've won, like, 40 between there and Flying Dreams? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when I was in at the Gardner Ale House, um, uh, in the nine years I was there, I think we won 39 Medals. Wow. And then um, in the three years, well, we can't, we're not counting the, f- well, yeah, in the three years that we've entered since we opened Flying Dreams, I think in Worcester. we've won um, yep. uh, a total of 10. Wow. So far. What do they award for? I mean, they award for taste? They, for different, so, you know, it's a category, right? Oh, yeah, so, so IPA, so, yeah, lager. So you have IPAs, you have porters, you have stouts. Oh, okay. whatever, different you styles know, of beer. Stu- like fruit beer, uh, sour Ooh, fruit beer. beer sounds good. Um, you know, there's just all different categories, and so you enter your beer in whatever category it is, and then the judges will judge all the same beers, the same style of beers from different breweries. And in mostly that category. the judges are like other brewers and well, like beer connoisseurs the, uh, and stuff. It depends on the. Um, uh, on the competition, but it's Different very competitive. Are set up yeah, it is. It is, and there's a you know, a, a lot of beer entered. Yeah, that's amazing. So, getting back a bit to the to the fostering and adopting for people that are listening and and considering it or have been in your position, I don't think many people have been in a six child situation. But we never we, thought we would be there. Either. But you hear stories too all the time, and you see these reality TV shows where people are. Yeah, we should have about, one of those. You. Yeah, I know. You were talking about yeah. that. Between the six kids and six craft craziness. brewing, six kids. And then, yeah, the beer business. And drama. I mean, psh, drama at the Cake house. boss move over. You, you, <laughs> you, know? you can't have... I like Buddy Velastro. I know. Not, nothing you against him, I just think. You can't have six kids and not have drama and craziness every single day. And you just roll with it. You gotta. Keep on keep on trucking and... and, and, and what is that saying? Um, bob know. and weave, t- tuck and roll, oh whatever you got to do, right? It's crazy. It's nuts. I never know day to day what, what someone's going to throw at me because I'm dealing with six different people's Pers- personalities, emotions, feelings, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't know day to day who's going to do what, you know. But the two of you are a team and that's what's important. Totally. But, so according to state data, just so people understand how how big big of an issue this is is that the master from data from the mass department of youth and family and from the mass adoption resource exchange which is known as mayor um as of 2016 there were approximately 9,600 kids in care and nearly 3,000 children in foster care when i say in care that can be state care and nearly 3,000 in foster care with the goal of adoption but out of that 3,000 more than 800 have no match and are waiting for a permanent family. So when you thought about, because you made a comment to me, uh, and I don't want to repeat it, I want you to repeat it, but you made a comment about wh- why you did it and you have thought before that you wanted to give up, but you have such an impact on this child's life that you couldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It, it's hard to take somebody else's child into your home and, and, you know, make sure their needs are met when you have no idea where they come from, what they've been through. You know, this child is undoing six years of potentially bad behavior and things he was, you know, you never know what he was exposed to. And, and the, the thing that kind of keeps me going as far as doing foster care is just you know, he deserves a chance, you know, and he deserves, and all these kids do. I mean, there's a serious problem and shortage for homes for children, you know. Well, and, that's part and, of the and, reason and, I wanted to hear that you can do it. Right. Well, from you. That was, that was a huge part of why I kept Charlie, too, was because if I didn't keep him in my home, he was going night to night, bed to bed. I, I, he wouldn't have stayed at the same foster home. At, like he would have been at a different one every single night until potentially really? somebody could have taken. Yeah, because there's just a huge shortage on, on foster homes, you know. So, so that was like, I, I just needed to, I needed to do it. I needed to make sure he was safe and, and loved. And no matter how hard it got, I just, I had to do it. Okay. Yep. Um, and I hope somebody listening who's considering it or is in the situation where they're saying, I don't know if I can do I it. I say it's do a- it. 
you know the 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 it, it's rewarding you know to to know that you we have changed this person's life you know i mean the the path he's gone he was going down could have he could have ended up a, a convict and now he has a much better chance at at being a very successful person in his life you well know? I, th- I think it takes special people to do that yeah. and i think to make any business successful even craft brewery which is it reminds me a little bit of when I was in biotech and I was in Cambridge and it was very small, but everybody was looking at the growth. It was growing and growing and growing and growing. It feels like to me the craft brewing business and the brewing business in general is just a, on that precipice of about to kind of explode. Every week it seems like there's something about something happening with somebody expanding or somebody trying to start a new in a new part of the state. I say it's like a brotherhood, you know. People are like, oh my God, aren't you afraid there's gonna be so much beer out there and, and, and people aren't gonna make it and I, I don't think I don't think it's quite like that. I think it's like um you know, it's like something for adults to do, you know, they're going around, they wanna keep trying new delicious beer of all sorts, you know? I read, I think it was on the Mass Brewers Guild website, which is kind of the state association, right? Mm-hmm. I think I read they did some contest where they had like people uh, go to wh- however many breweries whoever had the record and taste all of these beers and then they won some kind of prize. But it's kind of when you hear about people trying to go to every baseball stadium that there is in the country. Yeah. Do it. It's almost like they were doing that in Massachusetts. They were trying to go to every single brewery. It's pretty hard that. to do because uh, I was actually talking to a few people who were, their goal was to try to get to every Massachusetts brewery on this um, Massachusetts Brewers Guild, you know, um, uh, that's app, what I was looking app, at. App, yeah, yeah, that's what I was looking at. Map app, yeah. right? So <laughs> uh, their goal was, and they said it's really hard because there's, you know, every time, you know, it's like every month, three, four new breweries are opening. And they've already been to that area or something? So you can't, it's like almost impossible You'd to You'd have to go and go all. back and go and go you back? Go, yeah, it's like really hard right now to visit them all because it, uh, it's growing so fast. But they, Whiskers yeah. become a really cool place to to come visit beer, you know? Well, yeah. So uh, on that note, according to the Mass Brewers Guild, you're one of many in the state. There was a record number of brewery openings last year, so in 2017, and their data states there were 160 craft brewers, uh, breweries in Massachusetts. Now, I got a quick lesson from you recently when I visited um, your uh, the tap room in Marlboro that that number includes commercial brewers, tap rooms, production breweries, and I'm probably missing something. Um, so it's, I think there's also, um, uh, like, there's breweries, contract breweries. Okay, so right? they... So, they, like, you're, you're a business, you're a brewing business, but you have another Someone else distribute... Make your beer. Oh, makes it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, because this, this whole craft brewing business, I think, is, is, uh, is, is growing out of control. Now, you... We're going to switch gears now and talk more about this. You got into the brewing business... In college, you went to the University of Vermont, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I didn't get into the brewing business in college. I got into the drinking business in college. Well, listen, I went to UVM, <laughs> uh, all stories on the table. I went to the University of Vermont for my freshman year and transfer. But when I went, the drinking age was 18. So we weren't <laughs> doing anything that wasn't legal when I was there. Oh, oh, yeah. That, <laughs> right. So let's just, let's just say this. I started brewing when I was 21. <laughs> okay, so did you start with like those home kits that you yes. see? Um, so I actually, well, not really. Um, I actually started um, with my ex business partner from the Garden Rail House, Rick Walton. Um, he was already um, home brewing in his basement um, when I graduated from from UVM, and uh, I was like looking for jobs and stuff in mm-hmm. my in my science field, right? You're and a scientist. So I was living at home for the first time in five years. And I think that my mom was basically just trying to get me out of that house. <laughs> and you said, Mom, I'm going to brew beer and in the basement? No, she's, she's the one who said, hey, you know, Rick from down the street, because he's actually my parents' next door neighbor. Oh, okay. He, he makes beer, like, for fun. You should go, like, <laughs> brew beer with him sometime. And I'm telling you what, one time I brewed, you know, I called him up. I said, hey, I'd like to brew. I hear you brew. I'd like to brew beer with you. He's like, yeah, man. In his basement. Down. In his basement. And he had a crazy rig set up. He was well beyond, like, the normal home brewer at that point. And um, so he taught me sort of like what he knew at that point, and I just went like, Phew, like I just well, my, you're a scientist saw, by nature, so yeah, like I mean, I was just like, I get this, this is amazing, you know. And mm-hmm. I mean, I love drinking good beer, and I think back in, you know, 2000, 2001, um, it was a lot harder to find good local beer. Right, it was still Bud Coors, you know, the major I mean, brands. So there was Sam Adams then, there was Harpoon then. You see, but I don't think of Sam Adams a few, as a, even well, though they are a craft like, brewery, they, they were just started started. Like just the saying, craft Those were the beer ones industry. that back then were like beers worth drinking, the right? Beer. There weren't as many <laughs> as there are now. Now there's so many choices, right? But, um, so I thought like, you know, hey, 
you know, I'm like we start. So I started making beer with him, and he was already making pretty good beer. But like when he started getting a buddy, when he started having a buddy that like could make beer with him, you said, "Let's he, go into business." No, right? he was like. Okay, let's like we were both just like let's make beer next week. Let's make beer next week. Let's make beer next week, and we were just making all this beer. And then of course, everywhere we went, either of us we would take beer with us and sample it to our friends and family and whatever. And before you know it, people were like, "Dude, this is amazing beer!" Like, mm-hmm. like and there's so many different make beer for my wedding, make beer for my really yeah. And we were like, "Whoa!" Like we need to like start a brewery. Now. I was gonna say mm-hmm. how much how, if you're brewing for a wedding and you have to serve I don't know 150 people. Uh, how how do you do that? Right. So so you had to go get a bigger setup. Yeah. So we started the Garden Rail House together. So so at that point, when we decided, hey, we're going to start a brewery, he basically started writing a business plan. Right. He's uh, ten years older than me, mm-hmm. um, fifteen years older than me, um, and you know um, he started writing a business plan and putting together this this plan to start this brewery and i went back to school and i got my master's degree in brewing science and which i never knew there was such a thing the university of it california a Davis. master's in brewing science it yeah. was before everybody wanted to go to brew school well it wasn't before everybody <laughs> but yeah. uh, for instance um, my friend jeremy who's the master brewer for lagunitas was in my class um, so so then i um, out of brew school i got you know so he's doing the you know this, yeah he's figuring it out Get, you know, figuring out his plan, how we're going to start this brew pub, and I'm just trying to become a better professional brewer, right? So I got that um, degree, and then I got my first job with Red Hook Brewery in Portsmouth. That's a big one. Uh, New Hampshire. Yeah, I wanted to have my first job be a big one so I could, because I knew that eventually I'd want to start my own brewery, and then it's small. You're always going to be small and build up to big. So I wanted to see what it was on the bigger scale. How do you get there? First. What is there? What right. is the goal? And then... Right. So, um... Three years into my working there, he called me up one day. We were obviously in contact, and he kept on, you know, telling me where he was and what he was doing, and I, you know, I was telling him what I was doing, and uh, I, I remember the day he was like, all right, well, uh, are you ready? And to, I was like, to open up. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, sure, let me just quit my job, and I'll come down there, and we'll <laughs> open it up, and that's what we did, so... Uh, we started up the Gardner Rail House in 2006, and I was the, uh, you know, he was the the main owner, and I was a, a small uh, a small owner and uh, the master brewer there for um, almost a decade, and I got a, you know a lot of experience creating new and interesting recipes there, and and uh, um, won a lot of awards and Where stuff. Where do you come and, up with a recipe? It's hops, yeast. I, I don't know. Water, I'm not a scientist. And, I don't and claim malt. to be. And Water, it? malt. Yeast and um, hops. hops. Yeah. Four and then, grapes. and then, how do you play around with that? I know you guys have like a coffee stout, and you said earlier fruit brew, brewery. Brews. I mean, there's how there's you nothing, um, you know, experience, right? I, I mean, it's just like being a chef, where in the beginning, when you're just learning how to cook, you know, you open up a cookbook and you follow recipes. There's recipes out there, right? Like, so when you're first starting to brew, you like you can look and see what other people have made, and you try to basically copy it. Right, and it's just like cooking. Right, you learn by making other people's recipes, and when, once you've done it for long enough, then you play you around. You start understanding it. on a, on a, you know that like, hey, if I put a pinch of this and a pinch like of that, like you don't have in, to measure this out anymore. Like you well, already know no, how to make it. You have to measure it. it still, but like you just know how much of a, a certain ingredient is going to give you certain flavors and colors and bitterness and you know the different things that we're getting out of beer. You start to understand that a little bit of this is going to give you that flavor. Now. Once you understand that, you know, it's a matter of still exactly weighing out the ingredients that you want to weigh out so that you can do it the same every time. But then how do you batch it? You have to batch it in small batches. When do you decide, like you're in, like I said, you're in Park Ave, um, you're, where you do your commercial brewing, right? The big tanks for people that don't no know. I'm, home still, brewing I'm trying to, no, no, no. I'm trying to simplify. So you decide you're going to open Flying Dreams and you come upon Warmtown Brewery that says we're moving out of this location. Yeah. And they left some of their equipment there, which I'm sure you had to change. Please. But yeah. So how did you then, who, did you have a taste tester? How do you just play around? Do you drink it yourself? Do you give it to I'm, Stephanie? I'm the and primary says, taste tester <laughs> as well. It's the, okay. it's the hardest part he, of my job. <laughs> the first batch that was brewed at Flying Dreams in Worcester was sold. There was no, like, test batches. Dave so, was working so luckily, part-time. So, so luckily, though, the Gardner Ale House's system was an eight-barrel system. Okay, Which is small? I don't well, know. A so little eight, bit smaller than the, so warm t- the Park Ave location. A barrel is about 30 gallons, okay. 31 to be exact, but let's call it 30 for just to make it easy. Um, so um, in Worcester, the Worcester Brewery is a 10-barrel system. Okay. So it's a really – so I've already, I'd already been for almost 10 years making that size batch. 
So two barrels bigger is is really not much of a jump. You're just it's a lot of proportion, you know, similar proportions, just a little bigger. He was also brewing for as a part time job before we opened Flying Dreams very briefly for Warm Town on that system. So oh. he was super lucky to kind of test it out before burn their beer before we had yeah, to make our beer. Yeah, a lot of people don't beer. know that. So because we were waiting for Some so we, we were waiting for our um, our federal uh, brewing license to come through, and they so they were using that. Um, Park Ave location as like a test brewery until we got our license and then they were like then they said okay once you get your license we'll move out and you can start oh. yeah, so, it was, so, it really, so they the hired me aligned. for the summer I was out of a job and I was just I was waiting for this federal license boy you so, fell into some good situations yeah yeah the stars it's hard work very though nice it's hard work dream big thoughts become things yeah that's Isn't that what's of, on your can yes. right here? Dream big, yes. thoughts true, become right? things. Doesn't that make sense? So tell me real quick, uh, we only have a few more minutes. How did the Flying Dreams name, I know you get asked it a lot, how did that come about? So it's a few different things. Um, you know, one is as a child I had a lot of uh, flying dreams. So you know, Dreams of you flying. He yeah, like Superman, right? <laughs> like Superman. Like I was Superman in my dreams. I hope you never <laughs> tried that. Right? <laughs> no. It's pretty amazing. Unlike falling dreams, which are terrible. <laughs> flying dreams are really amazing and empowering, and um, you just... There's nothing like I've never had any other dream that's quite like a flying dream. You know, it, it yeah, you you wake up and it's like a sense of empowerment. It's a sense of, man, I can do anything. People tell me something's impossible, but it's not. Did people tell you this was going to be impossible? No, but you know, or, lots of people always tell you how hard it's going to be. Right, they're you skeptics. Know, and, yeah. yeah. And not everybody. You know, can, I've been telling not people for a long time that I was going to branch off from the Gardner Ale House and start my own brewery someday. And I think a lot of people were just like, yeah, yeah, yeah everyone yeah, says yeah. that, you know. Well, because, I mean, 160 and then Central Mass, according to Mass Brew Brothers, which is a blog, they show that 25% of all the breweries in Massachusetts are in Central Mass. I mean, this is like, it is branching out. I saw a story this week, now one's talking about op- trying to open in Franklin and saying that they're the w- first one within 20 minutes of Franklin. So, yeah. I mean, it's like every week somebody's coming out. So, how do you, you have to differentiate yourself. But you also told me, Flying Dreams, you're a big, you were a big fan of disc golf. You used I, to play- I am a big fan of disc golf. I just don't get to play it as much as I used to. Um, that's the one thing about that's flying. about starting throw. a business and having a bunch of kids right. <laughs> is that disc golf sometime, takes the back burner. sometimes no you hobbies. have to give up something. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was my, my main hobby. Hobby and I didn't like mm-hmm. give it up, but I just don't play four Take times a, a week anymore. I play like once every three. That was months. also part of the Flying Dreams name is a little ode to disc golf. And for people that don't know, real quick, disc golf is it's basically golf, but with um, frisbees. modified frisbees. You throw a frisbee into in a, a basket. Hole. In disc golf, we call them discs, though. <laughs> oh, sorry. Like no, it's cool. Uh, I'm calling it. So for all my Some disc golf and friends do. out there, like we got to keep this straight. You like played disc where? golf, not frisbee golf. Where did you play? Um, I play all Lester. over, but um, um, yeah, Leicester is uh, Maple Hill. There's one right here in Worcester, uh, right Hill. down the street on uh, Newton Hill. Right by Doherty um, High School. Right behind Doherty High School. Um, and then that's competitive, too. What? Disc golf. Just oh, like beer oh, making. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that they attitude. compete. There's competitions. Yeah, and... but in disc golf, it's a little di- I mean, you don't, you can wear whatever you want. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You don't you, you don't have to wear, yeah. like, the fancy clothes. <laughs> um, As in regular golf? A lot, a lot of courses. A lot of disc golf <laughs> courses around the state and around uh, around the world, um, I think, uh, at least in the United States, are on, um, you know, state lands, right? So they're free. Like, you don't have to pay greens fees, right, for instance. So there's some fr- uh, private courses starting to pop up a lot as it's growing, but, you know, you, so you go and you play for free. You can play with your parents, with your kids. You know, you walk around, you're in the woods. Yeah, it's um, like hiking with an objective. I yeah. always say that. You know, we've brought our kids out many times, just, you know, get outside. And I mean, that's a not whole behind Doherty yeah, High yeah. School, but <laughs> a lot of courses, right, you can go and, and bring beer and crack a beer and drink a beer while you're playing. And, um, you know, disc golfers really love their craft beer. It's, uh, you know, disc golf is a little bit of counterculture. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, maybe not now, but for a long time, craft beer or good local beer was also kind of counterculture. And you know what remi- that reminds me of is when you see a guy in a suit and tie riding a Harley to work. Mm-hmm. It's almost the same thing. Right. They go to work in the suit. But they come home and they jump on the Harley. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? You're, you know, these people are serious, but then when they go off and play disc golf, they want a beer. Now, you started canning. We have about a minute left. You started canning, and, um, you know, you ha- you're canning there. You open the tap room in Marlboro, which is got seating. It's got seating for 75 and standing for 50? 50. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's bring your own food, which yes. is also another big thing in the craft room because it lets you focus on the beer. You don't have to get a restaurant yeah. license. And all the right. local restaurants seem very happy in to Marlboro, deliver yeah. right to our, um, to our tap room. Yeah, you have, I was in there, you have uh, menus at yeah. every table. Yeah. 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 So how many staff are going to be there and how many staff are going to be... Or how many um, staff are there and how we'll many? We'll have most? probably two or three people on 
at a time in the beginning, depending on, and then if it gets super busy, we'll have more people. Dave and I are going to be there all the time for the next few months. So what, With the six know, kids at home. Yeah. Yeah, my mom. She's a champion. Again, another shout out to mom. So yeah. <laughs> as we wrap up, um, one piece of advice. You said earlier, do it. Is that your one piece of advice for somebody who's considering fostering, but they're concerned about, I don't have any money, how much money are they going to give me? What about the mental and physical challenges that might come with someone, you know, the baggage that a child might bring to my house? What would you tell them? I would say day by day. Don't. And don't, to do it. Yeah, to do it. Definitely do it and just take each day by day. It'll, and that it'll work support. itself out. Yeah, yeah. Right? What's, what's, it'll what will be will out. be, and in the long run, you're probably going to, even if it's for two months, that's why how I feel about the 17-year-old, you're really going to probably um, put a stamp on somebody's life that they'll never forget, you know, the help that you've you're given not, them. You're not going to be perfect, but that's, that's, that's everything in life, right? When you make a big decision in your life, you can't, you can plan for some things and you just can't plan for everything. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. But your mis- your few mistakes are still going to be nothing compared to, like, what you've done for these kids, you know? Okay. So thank you. And on that note, I want to thank you both for coming in and telling, your story, th- and telling your story about fostering, adoption, family, disc golf, brewing. Flying Dreams has its large batch brewing and tasting space and retail on Park Ave in Worcester next to Peppercorn's Restaurant, and they have a tap room with capacity for 125 on Main Street in Marlboro. When, five days, Wednesday through Sunday. Okay. So let's make a proverbial toast. Here we go. To family, work, and life balance. That's Community Conversations. I'm Vicki Green. Have a wonderful day.